Captain Dylan Hubbard. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Jim, you got our time to be ready? Thank you, sir. All right, all right. So uh, appreciate the warm introduction and uh, appreciate you guys having me out to uh, join you for the uh, Old Salts Fishing Club meeting. Always enjoy coming over here and hanging out with y'all. Uh, tonight, wanna talk a little bit about uh, near shore, offshore fishing techniques, tips, tricks, whatever you all, you all wanna talk about. Uh, I like to always make these things a little bit more of a fishing conversation. And I like to kind of talk with you instead of talking at you. So I don't want to stand up here and just drone on. So I really hope some of you guys have some questions for me uh, because that's how I like to try to do these things is more of a conversation. So uh, I'll kick it off by kind of talking a little bit about what's going on now, what we're kind of looking forward to. And then from there, hopefully, someone will have a question and we'll start going down the path because I want to talk about what you guys want to talk about, not just stand up here and talk the whole time. So please start thinking about some questions. Okay, guys. Now, uh, first of all, by way of introduction, Captain Dylan Hubbard from Hubbard's Marina right across the water. And uh, we do a lot of different uh, near shore and offshore fishing trips at Hubbard's Marina, private charters. Uh, I'm also blessed and honored to be uh, a part of the Florida Guides Association, serving as president this year. And also I sit on the board of the Charter Fishermen's Association for the Gulf of Mexico. So as Zach noted, uh, a, a little more involved in fishery science and management than I would like sometimes, uh, but it, I definitely have a passion for it and enjoy it a lot too. Um, and also the Marine Resource Education Program. So if you're ever interested in that, definitely drop me a line. It's a lot of fun and it's a great way to kind of learn more about the science and management side of things. And Zach actually just graduated himself wherever he got off to. Uh, so he can tell you a little bit about it. But uh, first things first, today is uh, later uh, mid-September, excuse me, sorry, I always forget what day it is, but uh, mid-September, we're kind of looking forward to at this point, I know all of you are looking forward to, like me, things to start cooling off a little bit, right? And uh, we're, we're in the mecca of king fishing, it feels like, at an Old Salts meeting, so we're all looking forward to that fall king of the beach, that fall run and kingfish and mackerel. Also, as days get shorter, those hogfish start returning to the ledges, get a little bit more concentrated, a little easier to hook in line. Right now they're all spread out spawning and make it really tricky to target by hook in line. Plus there's a lot of divers in the water right now swimming down and shooting them in the face. It makes it a little tricky uh, to target them via hook in line. So we're looking forward to the kingfish mackerel run, looking forward to the hogfish starting to heat up. And then also gag grouper, of course, as those cold fronts start rolling in, those gags start coming in, making it a lot easier to target them. Guys, I can't emphasize it enough. Take advantage of the gag grouper this year because it's going to get short next year and it's going to be a lot harder and kind of our prime gag fishing time is going to be closed for harvest next year. Remember, my favorite time is around Thanksgiving to New Year's Day and next year that entire period is closed for harvest for gag grouper. So take advantage of the gag grouper this year especially again like i said november december and uh live it up and let's all remember it and uh hopefully we'll get that turned around but it's going to be a little bit tight for at least two three years uh why they uh shorten those gag grouper seasons and access so looking forward to gags hogfish kingfish mackerel also right now we're doing pretty well on scamp uh, and trying to dodge those red grouper unfortunately that red grouper closure kind of hit us in the gut and uh, trying to dodge those red grouper while trying to maximize the gags, the scamp out in deep water. And then uh, right now we're doing really well on mangroves. Uh, historically, at least as when I was younger, uh, I always remembered mangrove snapper fishing really being premium in the summertime. Seems like the last three to five years we've seen a really good push of big quality mangroves through cooler months and uh, we're already starting to see the size of the mangroves starting to pick up for us out there in deeper water plus uh, really really kind of weird uh, odd really big increase in yellowtail snapper as of late i don't know if you guys have seen that offshore but we're seeing a lot more yellowtail snapper out deep than we normally would this time of year plus a couple muttons we've caught more mutton recently than i could say 
normally we do. So some interesting things going on right now and some good things to look forward to this year. Also Amberjack, who's been surprised by the Amberjack bite lately? I was, everybody's talking about, oh, Amberjack opens September and October. And I was kind of like, well, don't get too excited. We're, there's not a lot of them out there. We're not really catching a bunch of them, but this year opening season on those Amberjacks was very surprising too. So all in all, right now, it seems like fishing is hot, weather is hot, and just trying to dodge storms, right? That's been the biggest challenge offshore. Uh, now, from that, what do you guys want to talk about? Does anybody have a question? Yes, get us kicked off. Hey, Dylan, uh, you brought up the Red Cooper closure. It kind of, I don't know if you had inside uh, info on that coming, but it, it kind of came within about a 30-day period. All of a sudden, here it comes, here it comes, here it is. Length of duration. Uh, maybe some reason so i have no problem talking yeah so the question was about the red grouper closure and uh the reasoning the idea why it was short notice um there is a way that you can have advanced notice of it too uh the national marine fisheries service actually has on their website a quota monitoring feature and when you know a fishery could potentially have a quota closure, you can monitor it on their website and it makes it real easy to kind of forecast when it's gonna close based on the percentage of the quota caught. So anybody can monitor that. That's, that's right through their website and uh, I can send you the link if you're interested. Um, but as far as the reason behind it is, Red Grouper doesn't have a closed season, right? Red Grouper is open all year, but there is still a finite quota and what happened was last year's 2022 so 2021 the quota was overrun by a little bit which caused in 2022 uh, according to federal law the magnuson stevens act they have to monitor any fishery uh at any fishery in which the quota has been exceeded and then for red grouper we have an accountability measure which means uh when you overrun the quota the accountability measure to kind of manage the fishery is when the quota is overrun the following year then they have to forecast and project the, the quota being filled. And if it's projected to be met or filled, they mandatorily by federal law, the Magnuson-Stevens Act have to close the fishery. And that's what happened last year. And that's what happened this year. And probably, unfortunately, will happen next year too. But the positive note is, and to me, this is, this is not gonna sound good. It's a little shocking, but it's a positive thing. The fishery closing early is a positive thing, in my opinion, because what does it mean? If the fishery is closing early, that means we're catching the quota quickly. When you catch the quota quickly, that means there's a lot of fish out there, right? The biomass is healthy. And that's what happened with Red Grouper is 2014, they increased the quota to like 14 million pounds. I think it was 14.8 million pounds. And everybody got up to the podium at the National Marine Fisheries meeting and said, don't do this. Don't do this. The fishery is not healthy enough to, in, to sustain this big quota. And they did it anyway. And they passed it. And we had this huge quota for red grouper. And then slowly, since that big increase in quota, the catch was decreasing slowly. We were all doing pretty well in red grouper, catching some nice ones. But it definitely got a little bit tougher. I know when I started working full time on the 10 hour trip, we would go out there fishing 2014, 15, 16, and we'd drift on a 10 hour all day and catch 40 head at Keeper Red Grouper. We can't do that nowadays. And it's definitely changed in the last maybe 10 years for Red Grouper. But what happened is they had this big quota and then slowly the fishing got slower, 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 and the biomass was suffering. And then what did they do? They clamped down on the quota because the fishery wasn't healthy. Now we have this low quota and the fishery is coming back. And now there's more and more fish. We're catching those fish quickly. The quota gets filled, our season gets cut. So it's a product and an issue with the fact that science and management sometimes, actually all the time, lags behind what we're seeing on the water. Typically, it's about a three year lag between what we see on the water and what they're talking about at the management table. What is the current quota? The, quota, cur the current quota for Red Grouper, uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you with any certainty, but I would, I would guess, a uh, pretty solid guess, it's between five to seven million pounds. 
It was 14.8, I believe, in like 2014. Yeah. What? The quota currently for Red Grouper? Maybe, maybe for uh, a certain sector, but I know it's close, close to like four to, uh, I don't know. I, don't, I wouldn't correct anybody, I don't know. But it, it's, uh, it's basically a lot down from where it was. And the other wrench into the problem to answer your question on what changed with Red Grouper was Amendment 53. And this change from uh, the, coastal migra or the Coastal Household Telephone Survey, or CHTS, this is, that's the uh, data, the private recreational data that inputs into the model. They changed from a coastal household telephone survey to the fishing effort survey. And that effort survey indicates more recre private recreational catch and effort. And it also estimates a bigger fish. So you take what was historically a five pound average fish, let's say for easy math, because I'm not good at math, our quota is 100 pounds. If you have a 100 pound quota and you're catching a five pound fish, how many red grouper can catch, you know? Easy, 20. But then all of a sudden, you change the average size from five to seven pounds. Now you're catching a bigger fish. You now all of a sudden, the quota is the same amount in pounds, but it's less in numbers of fish, right? And then also on top of that, you increase the effort and show a higher number of landings. So now you're catching a bigger fish and you're catching it more quickly and there's more people on the water. All three of those things added together is why red grouper fishing closed early. But on the flip side of that, you're sitting there thinking, well, that sucks. On the flip side of that, also what Amendment 53 did and that, that data change, it stripped 17% of the commercial quota and moved it to recreational. It was like, 80, 20 ish, that's just a round number guess. 80% commercial, 20% private rec. Now it's 60, 40. Like a million pounds and change of quota was stripped from commercial fishermen and moved to private rec in Amendment 53. So everybody lost. Private recreational fishermen and, and for hire recreational fishermen have a shorter access to red grouper. We're catching them more quickly. The commercial fishermen lost a million pounds since 20% of their allocation. So Amendment 53 was jokingly dubbed a shit sandwich and everybody took a bite at the council level because everybody lost in Amendment 53. But the positive side that you gotta remember is the fishery is healthier. <laughs> that's, that's the way you can look at it. That's a positive way you can spin that one. Um, but to answer your question, that's why it was short notice is it's federal law when it's projected to be closed or the quota is projected to be met. Now, there is a glimmer of hope. What they're doing now is they're really closely monitoring that wave four catch. And if wave four catch isn't what was projected, they could potentially open a short red grouper season at the end of this year to allow us to more fully utilize that quota. So there's a slight chance mid October ish we could see an announcement for an extension on the red grouper season. Maybe. How is that enforced? You know, with all the boats out there, how do you enforce that? Amen. Amen. So uh, her question was, how does that enforce? Big problem. So the Marine Resource Education Program I told you about that I'm a part of, I went through that three years ago. And uh, one of the most eye-opening things uh, for me was the fact that NOAA, OLE, or NOAA Office of Law Enforcement, had 17 agents for the entire Southeast region. And so, for those of you who don't know, the Southeast region is the entire Gulf of Mexico, from North Carolina to south of US-1. So literally from North Carolina to Brownsville, Texas, and the Caribbean. So all of the Caribbean, the Gulf and the South Atlantic had 17 agents. The most recent Marine Resource Education Program, they came walking up, yeah, we got 21 agents now. I was like, oh, good job, bud. So they have 21 federal agents. Now, the positive side of that is recently, they, uh, in the last maybe five years, they entered what's called the JEA agreement with FWC. And that's a joint enforcement agreement. And what it does is 
it deputizes a certain number of FWC agents as NOAA agents. And they do that with the Coast Guard as well. So to answer your question, the feds, NOAA fisheries, use state law enforcement to go into federal waters. And that's why five years ago, if the FWC was out there in federal waters and tried to stop you, technically they couldn't. But now, FWC boat in federal waters can stop you. They're deputized as federal uh, enforcement. So, the or just specifically agents specific yeah. agents. You have to go through a pretty intensive process to get uh, JEA certified. To answer your question, not all FWC agents are part of the JEA program. Yeah, no, only certain agents, and you'll know it because they're the ones out in uh, federal waters. The, under the JEA program, they actually have to log a certain number of hours in federal waters. And those JEA officers with FWC are equipped with GPS monitoring. They're actually equipped with GPS monitoring on their, uh, on their camera, on their, their vest camera, and that actually tracks their hours of JEA enforcement. So they're GPS monitored on their bulletproof vests uh, to monitor their federal enforcement. So it's pretty interesting. No, never, no. Oh, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Question in the back? Yes, yeah, so great question. Uh, the descending devices, one of the biggest issues that faces our fishery um, in general, I think, is we're all here, this is a fishing club meeting. Look, at, look around, we're all, we're all excited about fishing, right? And we do such a great job with the technology nowadays, the, the GPS trolling motors. I mean, the technology just today compared to, I mean, I'm only 30 years old. And I remember as a kid, my dad would come home with the charter boat and I'd go out there and grab the roll of the, the bottom machine tape when it printed on paper and I'll roll it out and look at what ledges he was fishing that day. Nowadays, I mean, you can rewind your bottom machine to 20 miles back and punch a fish show and it, your GPS coordinate goes over on your plotter. And I mean, the side scan, the, the relief shading, Seymour maps, strike lines charts, Long story short, we have a lot of technology out there making it easier for more people to be effective. And you have a lot of these great fishing clubs that hold seminars to educate more people. You've got YouTube, you've got Salt Strong, you've got all these ways to not only become an effective fisherman with four engines hanging off the back of your big Freeman or whatever nice boat you have, but then you have you see these 42 foot boats with two trolling motors in the front and they're running out there and they're hitting a button and sitting right on top of their spot. And uh, the, the increase in technology, the number of people beyond 30, 40 miles has exponentially increased. As I said earlier, I'm, I'm 30 years old. When I was young working on the boats, going out on a 39 hour trip, on a 39 hour trip in the middle grounds at night, you might see five boats the whole trip. Nowadays, during June and July, you'll see 500 boats. <laughs> it's just the number of people on the water has increased, and that's not a bad thing. That's, we all love fishing, right? And it's, it's easier to go out there with the increase of technology, but as more people access the fishery, the pie is only so big, and you can't make more pie. We just all have to work off the same pie. So what he brought up was the descending devices and their importance it's hugely important because the big push right now at federal level, at international level, and everything right now, the big numbers or the big issue, the monkey in the corner that's being talked about now is discards and discard mortality. Right now, Red Grouper's closed. Red Grouper's doing better, we talked about. We're catching a ton of 16 to 18 to 19 inch Red Grouper. I mean, you go out there and you fish 160 foot, you're gonna catch a ton of those undersized illegal red grouper that even if the season was open, you couldn't keep. But you gotta toss them back. And if you're not taking care of those fish, you're not getting them up quick, you're not getting them off the hook quick with a proper de-hooking tool, and you're not getting them vented or using a descending device on them, that fish is gonna float away and die. And if he floats away and died, he's wasted. <coughs> And unfortunately, 
Those discard numbers are gonna be the death of our offshore fishery. You wanna hear something scary? What's being talked about right now in the South Atlantic? So everybody knows, how, how long was our red snapper season this year? For, for us, it was like 72 days. For private wrecks, it was close to 60 days. You know how long it was in the South Atlantic? One weekend, I think it was like two days. And you know what they're talking about over there now? Complete closure of federal waters. Not closed fishing, you have to return the fish. Literally, you're not allowed to go out there and fish. Literally, complete closure to access, no catch and release, you're not allowed out there. That's what they're considering for a majority of the South Atlantic waters on the east coast of Florida, from Canaveral to Jacksonville. It gives me the chills. <laughs> That's literally what's being discussed right now, and the reason why the driving force behind that is discards, because we talked about earlier federal law, and federal law mandates that you must end overfishing. So when you have something like the red snapper in the South Atlantic that is technically, according to the stock assessments, undergoing overfishing and it is overfished, by federal law, they have to end that overfishing. But the season's two days. The rest of the year, while it's closed, you know what's exceeding the quota? Discards. The discard mortality rate in the South Atlantic, which I think is really low, is only 8%. So they say 8% of the red snapper you throw back die. I think it's probably realistically a little higher than that, but it's a low number. So 8% of those red snapper they're catching over there and throw back die. And because they're catching so many of them so quickly and having to throw them back when the season's closed, that's exceeding the quota. So they could literally close the season all year and never have a season. And the number of fish that are being caught and discarded are filling and exceeding the quota. So what do you do? You can't open a season. The quota is already full and exceeded. That's against federal law. They can't stop the discard numbers unless they just totally close the fishery and to close access. You can't even go out there. And that's what's being discussed now. We got a couple questions. I'm going to try to go in order. Yes, trolling for grouper. Uh, so great question. Uh, trolling for grouper is not something that we do uh, very much at Hubbard's Marina with our big boats, but I can talk a little bit about it for sure. First things first, before I wrap up, I went on a little bit of a rabbit trail there. So I wanna close off that rabbit trail. The last thing I wanna mention is in the issue of discards and discard mortality, you guys really need to do yourself a favor and go to return the word return, emright.org. So return, emright.org. It's returnemright.org. It, you go there, you take like a little five minute course. There's a couple videos, a couple informational things, and you enter your home address. They send you over $100 in free stuff, including this sequelizer, which is about $75, $80 at Bass Pro. Uh, and they send you a three pound weight. That alone is worth taking 10 minutes to fill something out. That's a lot of money right there at three pound weight. So check out that website. Definitely fill out the information. Take the little course. It's pretty, in, it's, uh, pretty good info. And you get a lot of free stuff. So everybody likes free stuff, right? So to answer your question, trolling for grouper. Uh, trolling for grouper is very popular in Tampa Bay. And uh, we're coming into that time of year. It starts right now. As days start to get shorter, it starts to pick up. And uh, as we move forward into a kind of prime time, which is, again, Thanksgiving to around New Year's Day, it still is very good and very successful, even more so, really, uh, as we move into the spring. But you can't keep them after December 31st. But uh, they're around all the way through the cooler months. Uh, typically, the best way to troll for uh, keeper gag grouper is using like 60 pound braided line and trolling the edges of the shipping channel or uh, around certain areas of hard bottom. Uh, a lot of you guys are familiar with that hard bottom off of uh, the Reddington Pier, the hard bottom off of Blinds Pass. Uh, some of those areas you guys kingfish for King of the Beach, it's 
great grouper trolling area. The shipping, uh, the anchorage over uh, on the side of the Egmont Channel, just cruising the walls of uh, the channel at Egmont, even inside the Skyway to Port Manatee. Uh, the, there's plenty of good areas to troll for the gags. Uh, but around 60 pound braided line, most people will use a big spinning reel, like a 6500 to 8000. And uh, you're using one of those big plugs. And you're using like, I would recommend a Rapala X-Wrap 20, 30, 40. And you, th what takes skill with that is learning how far out to put it, what speed of the boat that you need to run at, because the further back it gets, the deeper it gets, the shorter it is, the shallower it gets, and it really takes a little bit of skill honing that in because you're trolling those big diving plugs like the Rapalas, the Stretch 30s, the Crystal Minnows, they're all pricey hard baits. <laughs> and you drag one into a rock pile and lose it, it gets pricey quick. Um, but it's easy to target those gags because when you're trolling, they'll come up and bite and you drag them off the ledge. And the biggest thing to remember when you're trolling for gag grouper is have someone who's paying attention at the wheel because when you catch one, when you hook one, someone's got to hit man overboard on that plotter quick because that's a good piece of bottom. And you could figure eight that and catch a, quite a few of them very quickly. Uh, but like I said, we don't do that a lot on our boats because they're not really bay fishing boats and we don't really target Tampa Bay too much. Uh, the expert in our area who kind of pioneered that fishery is Vance Tice. Uh, and uh, he knows it all, has done it all, and fishes the most. And he has a lot of videos out there. You can just Google Captain Vance Tice and uh, he'll have a lot of information out there on the internet and YouTube. Uh, and a lot of his seminars are also online as well. So I would definitely check out those videos for more information. But hopefully I gave you a good base to start out with. I don't wanna to go too much further than that because there's probably someone in this room that's better at it than me. Captain Doug back there does it a lot. Uh, next question I think was over here somewhere? No? All right. Changing gears. So last year I accidentally caught two black men. Don't know how I did it. <laughs> Wasn't target them. What's the best time of year and maybe the depth? You know, I want to start targeting this. You know, so the best time of year and the best depth to target blackfin tuna, I would say uh, historically uh, our best blackfin tuna catch in the recent past was February or January and February around the new and full moons, um, and anywhere past about 120 foot of water. Um, but you can really catch blackfin tuna year round here. Okay. Uh, it really just comes down to hunting pelagics and following those sea surface temps. Uh, so someone like uh, Dan Casey, wherever he got off to, uh, is an expert in following those sea surface temps and some of the more experienced kingfish tournament fishermen uh, who fish king of the beach successfully are all about those sea surface temps. You just gotta find one of those rips, one of those temperature gradients where it changes a couple degrees, just like uh, snook fishing or red fishing right now in the back bay. If you can find an area of the bay that's two degrees cooler than other areas, the fish are gonna be chewing. They're gonna be foaming over there. The same thing offshore. Pelagic fishing, once you get past 120, 160 foot of water, if you can find some sea surface rips where it temperature gradient is two to three degrees difference and it's close together, there's gonna be fish there. Whether it's mahi, wahoo, kingfish, sailfish, or tuna. Um, but generally tuna are following the moon phases. New and full moon and generally they're most active around those time periods. We run into tuna the most, uh, either trolling those Rapala X wraps, the 30s or uh, 40s, while we're trolling between fishing spots at seven to nine knots. We had a lot of success on the more realistic, natural looking Rapala lures. Uh, the Nomad DTXs work pretty good too. But to be honest, the best way we catch them is when we're out there on a 39 hour trip or 44 hour trip and we're anchored up and we're catching the heck out of grouper and snapper and we're sitting on a spot a little while. Once you're on a spot for an hour or two, you create a really healthy natural chum line. We don't chum on our party boat trips, but when you got 20, 30, 40 people catching snapper after snapper after snapper, they're coming up, that barotrauma that we talked about earlier, they're regurgitating all their food on the way up. 
So you create a really powerful natural chum line and that is what will bring in the tuna. Okay. And uh, we really do well at night out there in deep water. But we've caught tuna as shallow as 40 foot of water. Um, but those are the time of year, whenever that happens, when we get those uh, sailfish on the Betty Rose and things like that, those weird times is when we have really blue water close to shore. Whenever you're running out, you start seeing those uh, flying fish, it's a good sign that there's gonna be some good pelagic action around. In some years, like I remember when I was uh, working the charter boat, the hub, with one of our uh, captains, Sal, way, way back in the day, I think it was like maybe 12 years old, we were fishing that Reddington hard bottom off the Reddington Pier for mackerel. And I'll never forget, we were having flying fish, these little flying fish swim out of the wake. I was like, what is going on? And uh, sure enough, right up in the, the, the prop wash of the boat, a sailfish bill comes out and knocks one of the plugs out. And at that time, I was like, what's that? <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget that. And I, you could literally see shore, but that's what it was. We just had really, really blue water. The loop current had gotten really close to uh, the shoreline that year. So right now we have crap water. And uh, that has everything to do with uh, the Mississippi. Uh, we had all that flooding in Missouri and Kentucky. What, they had like a thousand year flood or 10,000 year flood. All that beautiful fresh water came out of the Mississippi, got caught in the loop current and got dumped at our doorstep. So basically out of Sarasota all the way to Big Bend, it's crap colored water, as deep as like a thousand foot in some areas. Uh, so really got to run south to get to that blue water at this point. But Mike Mahoney uh, and Mark Fewox out of, I think he's out of O'Neill's, they just went and caught a bunch of uh, pelagics and did really well, but they were 135 miles one way. <laughs> so, I appreciate that. a little bit of a run. I want to stay married and my wife has ordered me to catch more black fin. Oh yeah, they're good eating fish. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> deeper is better. What? Do I use sea surface charts? Um, Yes and no. I mean, when we, uh, my, my father over here surprised me by showing up uh, and he has used some of those charts on some of our longer trips. Like we used to do the pelagic magic trips back in the day where we go out there and troll for 72 hours. And uh, we used a lot of sea surface temp charts for that. Um, but again, back to technology. I was at ICAST, I saw you at ICAST, uh, and Garmin, uh, we're blessed to be working really closely with Garmin. So I was hanging out in the Garmin booth and they have that new Sirius XM membership that you can get. And uh, we're going to that and that actually, while you're offshore, 60, 70, 100 miles offshore, it'll overlay the weather radar on your plotter. So you'll be able to see the weather just like you're sitting at home in your, in your living room. And it shows you chlorophyll, sea surface temps, all this stuff in real time outside of cell range delivered to your boat via satellite. So super excited about adding that to the boat along with side scan and all that good stuff. Being Coast Guard inspected, we don't have a lot of toys on those boats. So we're, we're getting more technologically advanced very slowly and uh, excited about that this year. But to answer your question, no, because we're charter fishermen, we're going no matter what. We're going fishing, so it doesn't matter the sea surface temp or what the current's doing, we're gonna go out there and we're gonna figure it out. So to be honest with you, we don't measure it a lot. I, I paid the cheapest one that you can find uh, without doing the Sirius XM satellite service on your boat or paying a thousand dollars for rock charts or I think uh, Tom Hilton has another software that's like six grand. Um, the cheapest one that works pretty good is Rip Charts. That's uh, I think $175 for the year. And uh, I played with that a little bit, but have I used it heavily? No. <laughs> yeah. What does? Rip Charts? Yeah. I like Rip Charts. We've used it a few times for some deep water stuff. It's pretty accurate. For 175 bucks, you can't beat it. We actually have used rip charts to catch a lot of blackfin tuna, even within you know, 20 to 30 miles offshore of Mabo. So, but does it give you direction and suggestion points? Uh, well, well, something. Raw charts will. You know, forgive me, not not mean to 
execute on this top layer. Uh, it'll actually give you, uh, usually you'll have the Garmin areas where you have, they'll say a circle, let's say Wahoo. If you're looking at it, it's like 25 miles offshore, you're like, what the hell is this? But this actually will show you different temperature breaks. There are ways to very easily, we talk about out of offshore fishing all the time. You can actually figure out where the bait's gonna sit and where these fish are. And we're catching these fish essentially 25 to 30 miles offshore when they do come in. And it's funny, you see guys come in and they have a pile of blackfin tuna. A lot of times you have to be in the right place at the right time, but it's really, it's really helping what Dylan's talking about. It absolutely works, these extra aids. I mean, yeah. It doesn't matter if you're- Technology a makes your life easier, even offshore. Yes, sir. This message was brought to you by Garmin Electronics. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you tell them we sent you. <laughs> yes, sir. Sharks are a problem, a big problem. We got too many manatees. We got too many pelicans. No, I'm just kidding. Everybody's eyes were like, what did he say? No, uh, sharks are a big problem, specifically ridgeback sharks. Uh, so those are uh, the, the sandbars, the duskies, uh, out there in deep water, sharks are a big problem. And even in Tampa Bay, um, the problem with sharks is, relates back to science and management. Now, everybody gets all upset about sharks, and if I love reading the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council Facebook posts. If you haven't read them before, you're missing out. They're very, very entertaining. And one thing that I always see is brought up is sharks, sharks, sharks. It's dying. It's dying? Yeah. Test, test. I've been known to kill a few microphones in my day. <laughs> Learned from my dad. Um, but, but sharks are a big problem, and... Uh, the biggest problem that I see with the sharks and um, the issue is that it's a different side of management. So you have NOAA Fisheries, which is the National Marine Fisheries, the Gulf Council, and they are the ones who handle our red grouper, our, our snapper, our, all our fishery management plans or FMPs, whereas Endangered Species Act is what handles the turtles, all the stupid turtle gear. So if, if you start a charter business tomorrow, you have to have a hoop net, a dog toy, a spare tire, and this really weird net and some cable cutters on your boat. And if you don't, it's a $1,500 fine. Second time, it's a $30,000 fine. And that's an ESA or Endangered Species Act ruling. So there's different branches and sharks fall under HMS highly migratory species. So bluefin tuna and sharks and swordfish, some billfish are all managed under HMS. And it's actually international um, because they have ICAT, the, I forget what it stands for. There's a lot of acronyms, but <laughs> International Coalition of Atlantic Tunas, that's what it is. And um, so HMS basically falls under that and it's this like black box Long story short, very long story short, uh, a rebuilding plan for red snapper. When I was young out of here, we didn't really see red snapper. I caught my first one, I remember, and I was like, what's this? We were all asking each other one on the boat, what's this? Because we didn't see a lot of red snapper. Now we have them all over the place, right? The rebuilding plan for red snapper is one of the most big, or is one of the biggest success stories in conservation in, in our lifetimes. We saw a fish that was totally decimated in our area. Now we complain there's too many of them, right? Now, sharks on the other hand, so the rebuilding plan for red snapper was about 18 years and it was shortened at the end. Now they're considered not overfished, not undergoing overfishing. They're a healthy fishery, 18 years. You know what the rebuilding plan timeline is for sandbar sharks? 681 years 681 years and mako sharks it's like 800 years so sharks are a huge problem and um, my buddy captain travis thompson who's a board member on the florida guides association coined a term i forget what the term was i wish i could remember it because it was really good but basically these larger very easily fundraised for animals are a problem. Specifically, I was joking earlier about manatees, but manatees are a problem. The state of Florida spent $26 million this year to buy lettuce to feed manatees. We have so many manatee regulations out there. There's a huge population of manatees 
And now they, they die off every winter time because there's not enough food. Black bears, the state of Florida has been trying to open a black bear hunting season for like 15 years. If you go to an FWC meeting and black bears is on the agenda, there's normally 25, 30 people at an FWC meeting. If a black bear is on the agenda, there's 500 people there. You cannot even get in the room because of all the people there. Don't open black bears. Goliath grouper. They closed those in 1991, the year I was born. They've been trying to open Goliath grouper for 15 years. Since I've been involved in fisheries, they've been trying to open Goliath grouper season. This year, they finally got approval for 250 fish to be killed with a, a slot limit this big. It's severely, severely frustrating when you have these very large fish that are easily fundraised for. And that's creating another problem in our fisheries. So to answer your question, everybody agrees that sharks are a problem. If you go to any council meeting, everybody you talk to will be like, yeah, sharks are a problem. 100% agree. Council can't do anything about it. Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council has zero authority or regulation over sharks. It's all through HMS. And HMS will show up to council meetings occasionally because all we do is bitch about sharks. And uh, they just say, yeah, yeah. Well, you got about another 600 years to wait until you can fish for them. <laughs> it's, it's a huge problem. And everybody out here needs to keep that in mind because there's some things that keep getting pushed in legislation. This most recently was the, the fin ban. Everybody's like, yeah, ban finning sharks. The fin ban is what created this problem because there used to be 10 shark fishing boats in Madeira Beach, zero now because the only way you can make money off a shark is the fins. Fins, you get like 80 cents a dollar a pound for a shark, but you can get $100 for the fins. And if they ban shark finning successfully, the shark problem is gonna get exponentially worse overnight. It's a, the most, most regulated fishery in the Gulf of Mexico. It's pelagic long line and sharks. They have to have camp. Everybody complains about the, the charter fishery this year. We had to go to vessel monitoring systems. So we have to have a vessel monitoring system attached to our vessel that pings once an hour. Those mofos that go fishing for shark have to have a camera system on their boat and a paid observer. And the captain has to pay the observer. You wanna go fishing, you gotta take a federal agent with you. You gotta pay them and you gotta bring a camera, bud. Crazy, right? Any other questions? This is fun. <laughs> yeah, Lance. So what's going on with uh, broken preservation and shutting down fishing gear in the state of Florida? A lot of fun topics tonight. So pelican preservation and, and closing the fishing piers. The big issue with that right now is uh, I saw it yesterday. Super, super frustrating. I'm sitting there talking to the guys. They're getting ready to take the boat up to dry dock. We've got 20 guys on the dock. Down there on the, on the catwalk over there, the mangroves are firing. We're the last dock that you can fish from in John's Pass. Literally the last dock and I have to fight tooth and nail almost every year to keep it that way because everybody wants to close fishing. Yesterday I almost closed fishing. <laughs> it was so annoying. I look over and there's a couple like maybe three or four dads and four or five kids out there fishing. I'm cool. Awesome. That's super cool. Get the kids out fishing. I look over and two kids have pelicans hooked and there's a group of pelicans in front of them dad reaches over opens the bale pelican starts to fly cuts the line second kid walks over opens the bale pelican starts to fly cuts the line both those pelicans went and landed in that rookery line got wrapped around a tree they're both dead today guaranteed that's the problem and that's why fishing piers are closing because of poor education among our fishermen you cannot cut the line you have a fish hooked, you wouldn't cut the line and let the fish swim away with the hook in your line. Why do it with a bird? But unfortunately, there's this disconnect and people do it all the time. And I saw it yesterday for the first time, first, first hand. I walked over there, I was like, what are you doing? Really had to restrain myself not to yell at this father in front of his kids. But uh, I mean, they just didn't know. He was like, well, I thought if I pulled the bird in, I would hurt the bird. 
I was like, no, just unhook the bird. You'd unhook a fish, right? Unhook the bird. Yeah. But unfortunately, so often people just cut the line. And the more pelicans that are caught hanging in trees, we talked earlier about big, big animals, easy to fundraise for. You throw up a picture of a pelican strung up from a tree, tangled in fishing line, you can get enough political will to do just about whatever you want. And that's what it comes down to. It's fundraising, political will, and they have the political will right now. And uh, Zach's good buddy from Friends of Pelicans, uh, <laughs> Good job going head to head with that lady. Uh, she wanted to cage in our dock. She came down to the dock. She was like, you have a pelican problem when you're flaying fish? I was like, yes, yes, we have a huge problem. And we go, we, we put them all in barrels. We wait till everybody's gone, all the birds are gone and try to put these uh, carcasses back and get them away from birds. She was like, you can fix that problem. Go ahead and screen in the dock. I was like, okay, so you want me to put a bird cage over my dock? How would I load my boats? Well, it would save the birds. <laughs> she was dead serious. I was like, oh, okay, all right, I'll look into that, thank you. So, I mean, there's, there's, they're really good people trying to do a really good thing, but we need to meet in the middle somewhere. And the comical thing to me is you close the fishing piers to save some pelicans, those same fishermen are gonna find a new seawall to fish from. It doesn't solve the problem, it moves the problem. So to answer your question, the issue is going to keep getting bigger until they solve the problem. And uh, I don't know exactly how you solve that problem other than somehow mandating some sort of education. Land-based land shark fishing, you have to take a little course. And I hate to bring that up because I, I don't like the idea of the government saying you have to take a course to be able to go fishing, but I don't know. That's true. Whoever said that, that's true. I mean, unfortunately, in today's era, you, you have to kind of pander to the lowest common denominator, and that's what we're facing. It is sad, but the bad yeah. The other end of that spectrum is there's already two piers closed down. Yeah. South Naples South Fishing Pier already closed. closed. Yeah, and there's another one that's closed. Uh, not Daytona, but Pensacola, Pensacola Beer Pier closed as well. Both of those closed for this issue pelican entanglement. And I see it all the time. I mean, we, we have three pelican cages under our stairs over there. We rescue pelican after pelican after pelican. Our staff does. And we have two different pelican groups that come down to the dock that rescue birds too. I would confidently say between three to seven birds are taken off that dock every week with entanglement issues, hooks, uh, just a myriad of different issues that are all tied to lack of education in the fishery. Very, very frustrating to see. And you occasionally just see the dead one floating by, which is even more frustrating. Any other questions? Where'd the snook go in the past? Where'd the snook go in the past? September 1st, baby. They know. Someone puts a sign up or some shit. They disappear real fast when season opens. They, they know what time it is. It's like day and night. And uh, September, yeah, I'm posting pictures because there's a lot of snook. Oh, he is. Oh. <laughs> well, they were stacked up on our dock every morning and you could go out there and just uh, literally, I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch that one and, and toss it a shrimp and it was game over. Catch five or six a morning, no problem. But. Yeah, that was prior to September 1st. After September 1st, like uh, it was just a couple days ago, there was more than I have seen in a long time and Smokey's outside drinking, so he's not paying attention. But uh, he was like, dude, they're fired up. They're biting everything. I was like, all right, cool. I'm hop out, get my rod, get all set up. And I walk out there and they all immediately come off the top of the water and sink. And as soon as I cast it out, there was not a snook left. It was like they knew someone was walking on the dock to fish. It, I don't know what it is, but every year we see the same thing. Loaded, 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 September 1st, gone. They're smart. They have been around the block once. Permit fishing? So uh, permit fishing is definitely another one of those unique fisheries that we have uh, very consistently, uh, but not a lot of people know about. So. 
you'll have to wait till after the seminar to talk about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Any nearshore artificial reef, uh, right now, Egmont Key, Fort DeSoto area, there's a lot of schools of permit. Uh, we actually just caught a bunch of permit on our recent uh, charter fishing trip at one of our local, well-known public areas off the coast. That's where we're gonna leave it. But uh, I mean, some crabs, crabs are the, the ticket. You gotta have crabs and you gotta uh, anchor up and know the patterns. But if you have a tall boat, you have a tower on a bay boat, look at some public numbers get out there with some crabs uh, and watch the moons you want some moving water right behind that crab flush so like uh, the the day of the day after a full moon or new moon uh, on those public areas uh, Egmont Key channel the the, the shipping anchorage uh, anything you look up in one of those public numbers uh, artificial wrecks you'll be able to find those permit you need a tall boat you need some clear water and you need crabs 20 30 pound fluoro some good sunglasses and uh, a little bit of luck and you'll find them once you learn the pattern it's every day you can go out there and hammer them for a few weeks uh, wahoo fishing gotta go far gotta go deep and like the blackfin tuna it's a little bit of preparation knowing where those rips are knowing certain areas that are going to hold bait uh, and then a, a lot of luck and uh, be in the right place at the right time uh, what we catch a lot of tuna or a lot of wahoo doing that a lot of uh, i feel like not enough people know about or do is just high speed trolling there's one charter captain locally who will troll every day on the way out in those cooler months and hammer the wahoo when people are running past them not knowing what's going on remember a wahoo can travel and bite a lure at 21 knots so if your boat's cruising 22 to 16 knots 14 to 22 knots you should be pulling a high speed lure in the cooler month really all year no reason not to because there could always be that wahoo you troll two high speed lures what's the harm if your boat's going 45 knots then kind of sucks slowing down to troll a lure but it's worth it if you're running by a wreck or something offshore you see some baits we're slowing down uh, Steve Pappen over there with fantastic fishing charters told me something that I, I didn't know and I have no problem sharing his secrets um, <laughs> offshore when you run across some of that debris uh, I've always you see something in the water offshore oh there's a triple tail oh there's a mahi there might be something else on it let's let's troll let's let's throw some flat lines he drops a, a, a vertical jig on it jigs it and he said nine out of ten times you come across floating debris that's loaded with bait there's wahoo underneath it out there in deep water and i didn't know that uh, that was something i learned uh he shared it on the radio so i have no problem sharing it here <laughs> but yeah uh, i mean wahoo's right place right time looking for those temperature gradients um spring and fall they're here the most but our biggest wahoo came in uh cooler months um biggest one i caught was just recently filming a show with mike mahoney it's, it's about to come out tales from the dark side it was a 94 and change when i gaffed it i felt like it was 120 pounds i thought we had a world record i've never gaffed a fish and it pulled me i gaffed it, it was like gaffing a, a log it was crazy you know normally you gaff a fish and the head comes out of the water i gaffed that wahoo and it didn't even flinch it was just just nothing but dead weight in the water it was crazy it's a big fish and that was just full moon daytime out there bottom fishing having a flat line out if you're bottom fishing and you don't have a flat line out you are missing out on blackfin on wahoo on sailfish um no baker's not here tonight but one of our crew members uh mike baker super adverse to flat lines hated them when he started fishing with us he didn't do a lot of fishing he knew about fishing he was a pretty good fisherman great guy hard worker super smart love having him on our team but he wasn't the greatest fisherman when we start when he started but he knew how to fish and uh he hated flat lines don't put that out you're gonna tangle everybody up don't do that he was on that 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 filming trip with mahoney when we caught that 94 pound wahoo with the flat line every trip after that he went out and bought a, a spinning reel and was flatlining every day he caught six sailfish in two months 
He's a, he, he fly lines every trip now. It's it, night and day. You, can, you miss a lot of fish out there if you don't have that flat line out, especially if you're bottom fishing with any sort of success because you create that natural chum slick, you get that, that chum line going and you attract a lot of fish up to your boat. Even if you, a lot of people are like, oh, I didn't flat line today. I couldn't get those cigar minnows or I didn't have the cast net and I didn't get a thread fin. We flatline with ultra success using frozen thread fins. Whatever you got in the boat, throw it out there on the flat line. It'll work. A frozen piece of junk, whatever, it doesn't matter. If it's shiny and it smells funky, you got it out there on the flat line far enough from the boat, you're gonna catch a fish with it. So don't forget the flat line when you're bottom fishing. What? Uh, using a balloon when we flatline, uh, it depends. If we're anchor fishing uh, and we have good current, you don't need a balloon. Just let it out the back. And uh, a lot of times, if you have a strong current, it'll keep it higher in the water column. And then you're less likely to get some of those other species. If you have a slow moving current, blackfin tuna, that, that flatline starts sinking. That's when we get the black fin. If it stays up on the surface, you're, you're more likely to get one of those random sailfish, wahoo, most of the time kingfish. If it starts sinking, that's when you get into the tuna range. And then in the April or March, April, May, you'll, you'll pick up the gag grouper who comes up to the surface to eat because they're spawning and super aggressive. <laughs> but uh, generally it depends on conditions. If, Current is running with the wind. You can just set it out the back of the boat and it'll carry out and won't affect anybody. But if current is going into the wind and the wind's a little bit stronger, you can overcome that with a balloon and the balloon will carry it out away from everybody. Um, because again, we're party boat fishing, we're on a multi-passenger charter boat. So if a flat line can't be set out there and forgotten about and not interfere with anybody else, then we can't use it. So it really just comes down to conditions. Drift fishing, always have a fly line out because it's super easy. Put it out on the down drift side and let it, let it eat. And a lot of times you pick something up that way too. Any other questions? I don't know what time I'm supposed to be speaking to. So I expect someone over here to grab my mic. I'm happy. Is everybody else happy? Thank you. Was that, was that a cue to put down the mic? Yeah, you know, <laughs> Camera guy is shaking his head. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, guys? Now that they know the end is in sight, no one's going to answer their hands. <laughs> what? That affects there. Yeah. Um, and I know you were fighting the fight for a long time. So the reason I've been quiet about the sand recently, uh, so your question about the sand issue in John's Pass and the, uh, the build up of sand, the reason I've been quiet about it recently is essentially we had a big win, uh, really uh, a historic win. Uh, and I've been quiet about it under strict orders uh, by the people who helped us win. So we're just kind of right now kind of seeing how it plays out. But an update as far as the sand issue is concerned is the city council or city commission of Madeira Beach, specifically our city mayor, John Hendricks, uh, worked really, really hard in conjunction uh, with a, a variety of you guys and stakeholders who signed petitions and we got a good grassroots movement going and uh, Linda Cheney got elected. State Representative Linda Cheney. Um, I, I, I've met a lot of politicians in, in the recent past, getting involved with fisheries, getting involved with science and management and getting involved in the sand issue. And most of them irk me and most of them are during election season, I'll answer your phone call and show up to whatever you want. And then after they get elected, they don't show up or answer their phone call ever. It's very annoying. State Representative Linda Cheney is not that person. She worked her butt off. And I was actually in Tallahassee with Captains for Clean Water uh, fighting that 1508 bill on the water quality issue. 
And when I was there, she actually found out I was there and went into the crowd and found me, took me upstairs and took me into some meetings in the, in the state capitol where she was advocating for uh, this sand issue here. She got $1.58 million awarded to the city of Madeira Beach. It's actually being, the checks being represented or being brought to the city commission tomorrow at the Madeira Beach city commission meeting. So big, big, big win for sure. So. A hundred percent state representative Linda Cheney and uh, uh, Tammy, you know more than I do. Real quick. I'll, I'll give you the mic. <laughs> <laughs> hey, since you mentioned Linda Cheney, she, some people don't know because you may not know your state representative, she is vital that we keep her in office and she is up for election in November. So she needs all the support she can get because her opponent moved here for this election. She was moved here for this election to run against her. She does not care about our area. She does not know our beaches. She knows nothing about fishing. Knows nothing about our community. So we have to get Linda Cheney, I'm not trying to be a political speech, but this is vital to everyone here. And she will actually, we're doing a big fundraiser for her at Bark Life in Seminole on October 5th. Um, she'll be at Bark Life from 5 to 7 doing meet and greet. And But if you guys have the opportunity, please, it doesn't matter if it's $5, $20, donate to her campaign. I ran a campaign. They're expensive. <laughs> so please, please, please look into her, ask her questions. As Dylan said, this is a woman who will give you her personal phone number. And she'll answer. She, and she will answer you. She is phenomenal. <coughs> she, Dylan, I was right beside Dylan on the, the sand issue. Mm -hmm. And Linda was right there to pick it up when I didn't win. But Linda talked to me and we talked through a lot of that through the whole process. So I'm thrilled that she got that funding. So anyway, I just wanted to say that real quick on Linda because it's very important. And if Tammy ever runs again, she's got my vote. She was way steep with us in the water fighting over that sand issue too. So uh, definitely highly appreciate her support red blue yellow white it doesn't matter your political affiliation there is one who was working the issue and then one who moved here so definitely highly recommend even if you don't support her financially vote linda cheney uh so thanks for opening us up for that whoever has that question uh, but super important long story short check is being awarded tomorrow to the city of madeira beach city commission and from there it goes to the county uh the county commission and county uh i forget uh forget barry burton county administrator is working with army corps dep to get the permitting done and the project approved and basically what they're going to do is they're going to move that sand accumulation to replace the uh the dunes of madeira beach that were wiped out by ada so during uh tropical storm ada ate up all those dunes created all those flooding issues for madeira beach uh, that sand is going to be used to replace those dunes and uh so so the the long-term solution to um let's decide on how much i can say i haven't had enough jameson so <laughs> um long story short i think what the the long the big solution to solving our sand problem uh, we presented a long-term plan and the long-term plan is add beach groins back to the beach stop spending taxpayer dollars to put sand artificially on the beach because that's where it ends up so stop beach renourishment add beach groins back beach groins will naturally accrue sand they work really really well the southern madeira beach groins they just uh, got the money they've got the funding last year or the year before to replace and lengthen the Madeira Beach beach groins. And they're doing a study right now to try to find, try to find the Southern groins because they work so darn well, they're buried in like 15 feet of sand. They can't find the Southern groins. And that's why the Southern end of Madeira Beach is so long because beach groins work and it accrued so much sand, it literally buried them. So now they're lengthening and strengthening the beach groins, which will slow the movement of sand. Uh, in our area specifically, sand moves from north to south, 
So those beach groins will help. Uh, and dredging the problem out will help, making it deep again, uh, because it will increase what's called the ebb jet or the outgoing tide in that area, which will slow the uh, accumulation or accretion of sand is the terminology they use. Um, the nail in the coffin that'll fix John's Pass, the scientists said it that the county contracted, a longer jetty would fix the inlet and prevent the problem from happening again. And, and the most frustrating part is the scientists said this on public record in a public meeting and the county and Army Corps have a part of their inlet management plan to make that jetty 400 yards longer. But it's never been evaluated or even talked about because a longer jetty may, again, this is a direct quote, a longer jetty may have possible negative impacts to beaches to the south. So a longer jetty may have possible negative impacts to the beaches to the south, but it would save the inlet and prevent this problem. But it may have possible negative impacts, so it's not even discussed or talked about. Super frustrating. But a longer jetty, what it would do in short, in a very long story short, is a longer jetty, how many of us like shooting? Everybody likes guns, right? Longer muzzle means more muzzle velocity, right? So longer barrel, your projectile moves more quickly, right? Longer jetty means the ebb jet or the outgoing tide would gain velocity and our channel would straighten and deepen naturally. So a longer jetty would make John's Pass channel straight and make it deeper. And it would accrete sand. So by the time my son was my age, we'd have the biggest beach in Pinellas County. We'd be ranked number one, like sand, or we'd take that number one ranking from Clearwater Beach, because we'd have a huge beach, and you'd have like basically Mallory Square out there. The city would have to build a parking garage in Kingfish Park to, to accommodate all the people coming here. It'd be a huge win, plus a 500 yard jetty. Anybody heard of Jupiter Inlet? Summertime fishing that for snook on that jetty would be incredible, incredible. So it's a win-win-win for everybody, but possible negative impacts not even discussed. I got yelled at by the city, by the county administrator, or the county public works director, Mara Levy, Hammy, Mara Levy Hammer said, Mr. Hubbard, if you bring up longer jetties one more time, you will be excused from this meeting. I brought it up again. <laughs> I was excused from the meeting. <laughs> uh, any other questions? You're such an idiot. So uh, <laughs> Captain James works with us at Hubbard's Marina and he caught on, on my boat a hogfish under this dock. Great, great question, buddy. Way to set yourself up. Any other questions? We fell on during the seawall tournament as well. Oh yeah? yeah? Right here? You're not the only guy, Doug. All right. Ah, a little kid caught one. Yeah. All right. You're going. Keepers, yeah. <laughs> a keeper hogfish off the dock. Keepers, right here. Really? Well, it's right where the seawall changes, right on that little dog leg. There's a nice little ledge under there, a lot of, lot of uh, stone crab under there if you have the uh, cojones to swim under there, <laughs> which James has done before. <laughs> yeah, Dane Karcher, yep. Uh, not seeing any other questions. I feel like I'm over time and uh, appreciate everybody listening and putting up with me. So want to quickly also give a quick reminder before we wrap up, guys. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it tonight. We do do a Sunday night show every Sunday night right on our Hubbard's Marina Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Trovo, Twitch channels, 8.30 p.m. every Sunday night. Um, you can join in. It's free. We give away over $800 in free trips. Uh, Salinity gives away a free Salinity gear gift pack. It's only an hour long. We show you photos of what we've been catching, talk about what's coming up, and we answer your questions live. Every Saturday morning, check us out, 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. on uh, News Radio 970 WFLA. We also stream live on Facebook, The Real Animals Fishing Show. It's a lot of fun. And then also Friday mornings, 8.15 a.m., we do our Fox 13 fishing report. You guys fish a lot, right? Hopefully. Submit your local photos. 
If you want to be featured, you got someone in town who wants to be featured, you know someone, drop us a line, Hubbard's Marina. Our phone number is hopefully everywhere. Hopefully you got it programmed in your phone. Uh, drop us a text message with the photo. You can send it right to our main office number. Uh, I have my cards. Uh, in my backpack, I'll give you a card. You can text me the photo, whatever, uh, and include a little bit of information. As long as it's locally caught and recent, we'll include it in that Fox 13 fishing report. And then also our website. Hopefully a lot of you guys fish a lot, right? And I realize most of you guys probably have your own boat and will never fish with us. That's great. Keep in mind, our website is made and really I want to create and promote uh, the opportunity for everybody to utilize a lot of information on our website. All of these seminars, uh, norm I have a bunch of bags over here because normally I record my seminars and put them up on our website, but thankfully Old Salts did that for me. Um, all, our webs or all our seminars are up there. Every live show we've done for the last eight years are on our website. We have a ton of fishing tips and tricks, weather links. All the weather links that I use personally every day to check the weather for our offshore trips are there. Our fishing reports, every Friday we release a three-page fishing report with tips, tricks, trends, what's going on now. Uh, we have a lot of helpful information on our website. Webcams, you're getting ready to drop the boat in the water, you wanna see what the jetty looks like, what the golf looks like? Right on our website. Everything is there on the website for you. So even if you don't ever plan to fish with us, check out the website and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, TikTok, Fishbrain, LinkedIn, all that good stuff. Uh, just simply search Hubbard's Marina and uh, don't forget if you're too busy to go fishing, you're just too darn busy. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, let's give Dylan Hubbard another round of applause. <laughs> I'm going to